Oh, good evening everyone. My name is Hikiko and I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's episode, Sweary Files, Episode 2, Deadly Permonition 2, A Blemish in My Eyes, A Blessing in Disguise. This is going to be a long video and it was only possible due to the money that the patrons gave me to spend on all this shit. It's going to be a long video and there will be spoilers. I will mark them when we get there. So make sure you've grabbed all your stream snacks and your beverage of choice. I got mine. Mmm, delicious. Sit back, relax, check your coffee, because there may be a premonition in there. A deadly to premonition. Oh yeah. Give me them tree branches. <laughs> I don't know how to describe the feeling I felt when I saw the Deadly Premonition 2 trailer on that Nintendo Direct, but I think my neighbors might have heard my reaction. I was screaming, my fist was in the air, it finally had happened, and I never thought we would get a sequel. And then I learned... Toybox was developing it. If you don't know, Toybox Inc. are the developers responsible for all the subsequent ports of the original Deadly Premonition. From Director's Cut, to the PC version, to Deadly Premonition Origins. All of them have varying degrees of shitty things going on with them, and they have damaged the reputation of the original Deadly Premonition beyond belief. Now there's this public perception that Deadly Premonition, the original one, ran like shit, it was janky, it crashed all the time, and that just wasn't the case. And you can go check it out in my video right here. I was debating on whether or not to go into Deadly Premonition 2 completely blind, just avoiding all the rest of the trailers, and I really didn't have an option at this point because Toybox Inc did their best to hide the gameplay from the world. One month before Deadly Premonition 2 was set to release, IGN, of all outlets, were the first ones to show off 17 minutes of gameplay, something that Toybox themselves had failed to do. And well, here's the most upvoted comment on that video. The dialogue is stiff, the sound mixing is terrible, and the frame rate is awful. It's perfect. I think this comment really captures how much damage has been done to the reputation of Deadly Premonition. Now the public perception is the game has always been shitty and broken. It's because Toybox fucked it up and swear he let him do it. I just find it a little condescending that when IGN released their gameplay trailer, fans reached out to Swery and said, hey, you gonna do anything about that frame rate? and he immediately jumped down their throats and called them frame rate trolls. Oh, I'm sorry, was I not supposed to say anything about this 15 frames per second shit? Couldn't you have at least aimed for 24, the cinematic 24 frames per second? Ah, <sighs> we're okay now. 
Now I want to stress that first impressions are important, and projects Swery has worked on in the past are known for stumbling out of the gate, and Deadly Premonition 2 is no different in that regard. In the case of Dark Dreams Don't Die, it was the Xbox One exclusivity and the confusion surrounding the marketing. Did the game require a Kinect to play it or not? Fans also began to suspect that Season 2 was never going to come out, and their suspicions were correct in the end. In the case of The Missing, J.J. Macfield and the Island of Memories, it was a failure to release the game on consoles during the launch day due to publisher mismanagement. Steam users had the game for over a month before console gamers finally got it. And last, and certainly least, in the case of Deadly Premonition Origins, well, let's just say they're still releasing patches to this very day trying to fix that shit show of a port. Deadly Premonition 2 might be the biggest example of following that sweary game trend all too well. It failed to leave a positive first impression. Then the team worked overtime to mitigate all the problems people noted, but the fixes came too little and too late to repair the PR damage incurred from the terrible launch date of Deadly Premonition. 2. The Gamer of 2020 is a sensitive and fickle mistress. The gaming landscape out there is an absolute hellscape of astroturfed opinions originating from reddit.com or their favorite e-celebrity on YouTube. Gamers no longer play video games. They develop parasocial relationships with the people they see on their screens. And then if that person on the screen likes a game, then they like a game. But if the person on the screen doesn't like a game, oh boy, that doesn't spell success for your game. So you have to understand, First impressions matter, Swery. If you are not first out of the gate with your best example of your game, the best vertical slice, if you will, of the engine, of the story, of the music, all in one, out there, ahead of all the negative opinions, you've already lost the battle. Waiting on them down votes. They're coming. They're coming, I can hear them. We kick things off in 2019 in Thompsonville, a suburb of Boston. Hey, that sounds familiar. Are we finally gonna find out who murdered little Peggy? No. We're not. FBI agent Aaliyah Davis and her pizza-obsessed partner Simon Jones are paying a visit to our old pal Francis Zach Morgan to investigate his possible connection to a series of murders that took place in Louisiana back in 2005. The game places us in the shoes of Aaliyah, well, not really, as we are quite literally railroaded up to Zach's apartment at a whole 15 frames per second. What did I do to deserve this? Does God hate me? Straight out of the gate, the performance issues rear their ugly head, and they're not going away anytime soon. What is it about this leisurely walk through a hallway that is causing all this judder? This is an area where there's no action or major assets to render, and it's already chugging along. Deadly Premonition 2 takes the split timeline approach of True Detective. The interrogation scenes take place in the year 2019, and then Zach flashes back to 2005 Lucari, Louisiana, as he recounts all of his zany antics in the bayou to the agents. Now, the true detective plagiarism is not as borderline copyright infringing as DP1's of Twin Peaks, but the parallels are still there to be drawn. For example, like Russ Cole, Morgan is now a retired agent with a substance addiction, but trade beer 
here for doobies. He's also being interrogated by two younger agents about a long-standing unresolved case in the bayou. Blah, 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 conspiracy theory, crazy man, evidence boards, uh, swap out Sega Dreamcast pedophile swirl symbolism for overt Pizzagate references. I'm your invasive partner who has a passionate relationship with pizza, right? It doesn't matter what kind of pizza it is. As long as it's a pizza, it's beautiful. Pizza is a sacred food, remember? You don't need to feel embarrassed for being unable to stop staring at it. It enthralls all who gaze upon it. That's the power pizza. Stop, Agent Jones. Here's my issue with these interrogation scenes. They last 30 minutes at minimum, even longer if you choose to let the scenes play out or make observations within the room. These scenes are fucking boring. What we got here was the experience of showing up to your weed dealer's house and having to sit through an hour of his boring anecdotes and roundabout riddles before he finally delivers on the promise of the dank nugs, which in this case would be plot development Yes. <sighs> Bell, have you ever been to the Grand Canyon in winter? No. In the dead of winter, the Grand Canyon is terribly cold. Now I can excuse a longer introduction since we are dealing with the sequel. If it was providing some meaningful exposition to catch up new players or to provide a refresher for old players of the original, then yes, that's understandable. Have a longer introduction to get them ready. But it does neither of those things. Instead, what it does is just introduce a whole bunch of new, confusing information, which alienates both groups of players, old and new. Perhaps the team was just expecting the players to go out and purchase Deadly Premonition Origins beforehand. Oh god, I hope not. Hey Zach, what about those Greenvale case files on the table? Can I get a quick peek at those for a recap? That's a private matter. None of your business, Bill. There's a major hole in Deadly Premonition 2's story that I like to refer to as the Greenvale Gap. For example, didn't the events of Greenvale take place in 2006 in the original game? And now here we are in 2010. Okay, whatever. It's not a big deal. Things get retconned all the time. But it'd be very nice if they could define what was being retconned, what the key bits of information were to take back from the original Deadly Premonition into this one. Some sort of primer, if you will. Well, Deadly Premonition 2 does not provide you with any insight into what carries over from the first one. What was important, what wasn't, what happened in between. Now, I'm assuming that the writers were hoping you'd go out there and purchase DP Origins before playing Deadly Premonition 2. Or perhaps they wanted you to go on YouTube and watch a story synopsis of all the key cutscenes from the first game. Well, a lot of good that does if some of those cutscenes are no longer canon. I just don't understand why they didn't bother to create any sort of major recap for the Greenvale case, considering that it does play a major role in some bits of the story, but how they tie the two cases together? Well, it's a tad confusing. Just some notepad or maybe have a little introduction movie beforehand that you can choose to watch if you wanted a recap of all the major plot points. That and it's hand selected by the writers and director to highlight what the key information would have been to carry over in a DP2. Hell, even Shinmu 3 came with a seven minute video that recaps the events of both Shinmu 1 and 2, and there was an 18 year gap between releases of 2 and 3. So what's Deadly Premonition 2's excuse? Would it have really taken all that much effort to, I don't know, create a few still frames like a slideshow and then have bits of narration over it, highlighting all the main events from the first game? Take a look back at the original Deadly Premonition. And that's exactly what you got in between chapters. You got a- Previously during the investigation. 
And then they would highlight all the important key bits of information through slideshows and still frames. So in case you walked away from the game for a while, or perhaps a period of years since the last time you played the first one, you'd get a refresher course on what was important to know. They did not even bother with this one. So Ali and Simon grill Zach on a cold case about the murder of a young girl named Lise Clarkson, who back in 2005 was chopped up to pieces, and in 2019, her body was found entombed in a case of ice at a food packing warehouse that her family owned. What's that you say? You want to know more about the clean spots in the room? Oh, you mean the sanctuaries? Yes, yes. Uh, what significance do they bear on the overall plot? Uh, I've come to the conclusion, fucking nothing. Isn't that right, my fairy? Ah! Stay back! Stay back! Sanctuary! Stay! So during the interrogation, Zach finally gets around to recounting the events of 2005, but not so fast. Swear he's still gotta get in one more True Detective reference. From the deadly mesa, her looming red tree grows. Hidden in the glitches of the unity open world. He flies and rides his skateboard towards the boiling sun. And when Aliyahra moved her glove, her finger ran with blood. The bulk of the adventure found in Deadly Premonition 2, Road to Hell, takes place in the year 2005, where a much younger Agent York is taking a vacation in the small, deep south town of Lucari, Louisiana. And through a series of plot conveniences that happened off screen, York finds himself staying at Casa Pineapple with nothing but a skateboard and the clothes on his back. A skateboard? And I'm getting some heavy flower, sun, and rain vibes right about now. Coincidentally, York meets another person with multiple personality disorder, David the Chef, who has four personalities. Four Davids. D. Four. Oh, I see what you did there. Never thought the FBI would ever come out to a little old town like ours. I do work for the FBI, but I didn't come here for an investigation. I just happened to stop by on my way to New Orleans. <sighs> Never thought there'd be a murder out here either. And it was a 16-year-old kid. Now I tell you, this country seen better days. What you reckon, mister? Then, York butts his way into the cold case of Lise Clarkson for no particular reason. That's our setup. There's a severe lack of logical progression or agency for our agent. Now, in a typical investigation-based game, our protagonist would make observations of the world around them. They would find clues, interrogate witnesses or suspects. The path forward would be blazed by logical conclusions, wild hunches, and near misses. In stories about serial Serial killers, there's also a mythos of the killer being developed in tandem with the heroes, and the legend begins to grow larger as the mystery unfolds. It creates a thirst for justice in the audience, if structured effectively. The original Deadly Premonition had structure. There was the urban legend of the raincoat killer that was already established within Greenvale and prevalent all throughout York's investigation. From the opening cutscene, the raincoat coat killer causes York to veer off the road. He's the catalyst for the adventure, and he's also the omnipresent force of evil that had rained terror upon the citizens of Greenvale for decades, to the point where the townspeople shelter inside their homes when it rains. Put simply, there's the thrill of hunting down the mythological monster that moves the plot forward. Not only does Deadly Premonition 2 do away with the pursuit of a legendary serial killer, 
but it also removed mystery from the game. There's no established killer in Lucari when York arrives, and if you were to ask me who the real big bad was in terms of the overall plot, I couldn't even tell you. Scratch that, I could tell you, but you wouldn't like the answer because it's really dumb. York, and by extension, the player, feels insignificant to closing this case because the writers relied on using Deus Ex Machina devices to shuttle York along to the next plot development without any logical means of progression from point A to point B. Why does York do the things he do in this game? Well, let me introduce you to Hoongan. As for me, just call me Hoongan. Hoongan. Hoongan is a voodoo man that exists in between worlds, and I guess is just another imaginary friend for York to conversate with in a lineup of many. Why do we go from place to place in the story? Because Hoongan gave us an oracle. Is he a friend? Is he a secret enemy? Perhaps he's the bridge the story desperately needed between Deadly Premonition 1 and 2. Maybe you're just not smart enough to see it, but I seize it. Hoongan is what filmmaker Spike Lee would refer to as the story's magical Negro. And before you get mad, yes, the term is inflammatory to say by design to drive the point home that it's an overused trope. Oh, and Swery would also go out of his way to point out how stock of a character Hoongan is by comparing him to Scatman Carruthers from The Shining during York's skateboarding conversations with Zack. Yes, I think I see the connection now. A cheerful, wise, yet also mysterious African American who appeared in a variety of different films. My mind must be overlapping him with the skeletal gentleman. Do you remember his name? Ah, yes, that's it. Scatman Crothers. Swery's clearly aware of how tired and contrived the magical Negro archetype is in storytelling, but here we are. At dawn. Look straight to the north from where Lisa's body was found. Hey, uh, York, you might want to cool up with that. Now, personally, I'm a fan of Hoongan's design, and I think he looks pretty cool. But I was still hoping his role in the larger plot would eventually pan out into something substantial, like maybe he was running the show behind the scenes during the 2010 Greenvale murders. But no, nothing. He's a wasted opportunity at best, and he's a stereotype at worst. Outside of the hotel, two other conveniences are there to greet our friend. York meets a little girl, Patricia Woods. It is at this moment for no major reason in particular that York makes a lifelong pact with this little girl to protect her from all the evils of the world forever. I promise to protect you from all the evil in our world. Well, that's stupid. Then she hands up a wrapper for the designer line of drugs known as San Rouge, of which York has been actively trying to find the source of for a few years now. Then York takes a major logical leap to the conclusion that it must be connected to this murder in some way, based off of nothing. Their conversation comes to a close when Patricia's father arrives in his paddy wagon slash merchandise van. Immediately, you might draw the conclusion that Melvin and Patricia Woods are not related to George Woodman from the first game. It's an easy mistake to make. Melvin is instantly cool with Agent York and just hands off his young daughter to him for the rest of the game. No questions asked. Which brings me to my point that there's no real foil character for York to contrast or clash with like he did with the small town big hat George Woodman. Melvin is ready to roll out the red carpet for York from the moment he sees him. Our world is filled with information and it's all within their grasp. FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He immediately hands off the control of the murder case to York. No questions, no pushback. York doesn't even have to use his powers granted to him by the FBI to take over the case. It just falls into his lap. Well, Zach, that was anticlimactic. You're telling me. From this point forward, Patty joins York on the investigation, and I have to say, she's one of the better additions to the sequel. Patty acts as a straight man character to counterbalance all of York's eccentricities. While Zach may have been the player's ear for York's musings about movies, Patty gives the player a voice to respond back to York's weirdness. Wait, there's one thing I can say. Oh. What? 
When you talk to yourself like that, it really creeps me out. Did you start doing that after you became an adult? Or have you just always done it? Either way, you should stop doing it. It's really weird and like, makes me wince whenever I hear it. Ooh, Zach, did you hear that? Okay, I should talk about the town of Lucari itself. In a nutshell, it's a fiery and bright contrast from the perpetual overcast and raininess of Greenvale. This is the Deep South. Shown through the lens of a film-obsessed Japanese tourist and part-time alcoholic. Swery is a firm believer in location scouting, basing design around lived experience. As a matter of fact, Lucari was modeled after his own trip to the American Deep South. Back in 2017, Lucari from French to English translates to the square, which is a fitting description in more ways than one. It is a far cry from the vast and winding dog-shaped roadways of Greenvale, but I guess there's nothing wrong with taking a simpler approach to level design. Now I assume the design was meant to facilitate the new method of transport, which is skateboarding. I guess they didn't anticipate how giving the player this degree of freedom of movement could end up severely breaking the game in the end, ranging from major story skips or in most cases frustrating soft locking when the player goes outside of the playable area with no way to return back to the playable area, which happened to me more times than I can count. Later in the game, the out of bounds soft locking becomes a bigger problem as you get new tricks and enhancements for your board that increases attributes like top speed and it compels you to go out there and pull off sick tricks, which ends up getting you stuck in concrete pillars until you reset the game. I don't even understand why they included a top speed when the engine taps out at 15 frames. I can't even measure the difference in speed here. I commend the developers for finally allowing you to set waypoints, which was a feature that was desperately missing in the first game. Although it's kind of a moot point since Lucari is nowhere near the size or scale of Greenvale, it's still a nice touch, thank you. Another positive, a few chapters into the game, you will also unlock a method of fast travel when you meet the character of Raven and her Wyvern Uber-like service. You'll find these balloons near each major landmark and you pay her a few bucks to shuttle York around. It's not as convenient as radioing George Woodman to come pick you up, but at the same time, it's not tucked away behind an obscure side quest that many players would miss foregoing the fast travel entirely. Nice job. George, which do you prefer, mustard or hot sauce? You didn't come all the way to my house just to ask me that. The game takes a Xenoblade Chronicles approach to dishing out a plethora of mundane side quests and presents a seemingly endless grind of material gathering for an afterthought crafting system. The side quests don't do the game many favors either, and they can be boiled down into three main categories. One, shoot a bunch of shit. Two, pick up a bunch of shit off the ground. And three, shoot the shit with an NPC at a specific time of day. The rewards, if you could call them that, for doing these quests are downright pitiful. Truly pitiful, my little lamb. Hey, look, I got a random material that I already have hundreds of already. Oh, look, a new talisman. Oh, but I'm gonna need to farm more materials to upgrade it before it's even worth a damn. Hey, I got a new stamp in my book. Only 399 left to collect. I hope I can collect that get hit by a car 100 times one real soon. Just 94 to go. The side quests in Deadly Premonition 2 are a case study for tacked on and meaningless padding. I could excuse the lackluster rewards if the side quest did something to enrich the larger plot. None of the characters present useful information to pay into the folklore of Lucare, or even do all that much to develop the character of the quest giver. I mean, the most character development we see from anyone comes from Mrs. Carpenter. After you nailed the big five split.
In the original game, not only were you afforded the occasional wacky weapon, but the characters would give you a tiny quilt square to help illustrate the larger tapestry of Greenvale. The game rewarded you for venturing off the beaten path from the main story. You would come to discover that most everything and everyone in the town of Greenvale had a sense of unity and not the kind that fucks up frame rates. When the murder of Anna Graham happened, you got a real sense that the whole town suffered in some little way. Lise Clarkson dies in Lucare? Oh well, life goes on. Who gives a shit? Put her ass in the freezer where we keep the town's food supply. That's how little we care about this bitch. Speaking of the characters in Deadly Premonition 2, I barely know any of these guys. The original did a great job of establishing each individual character in the town hall scene when York addresses the case before the citizens of Greenvale. You get a good look at all the suspects up front. As a matter of fact, you get suspects in this one. Maybe there would be something about them that would pique your interest, causing you to follow them around town on the side. You could do things like peep through their window, follow them around in your car. In other words, the game provided you with methods of investigation. I dare you, try tailing anyone in Deadly Premonition 2 and the term afterthought will populate within your mind. The first time you see an NPC take an illogical pathway that defies reason or laws of physics to arrive at their prescribed destination. If you pay attention to any NPC, including the stock unity assets that they refer to as townsfolk, for any length of time, it will remind you that you're playing an unfinished game. Now I may have understated how big of an issue some of the game breaking bugs are in Deadly Premonition 2. Uh, I was paranoid the entire time I played it because I'd encountered so many soft locking events. Soft locking, of course, meaning I would encounter an NPC, for example, I'd talk to him, the dialogue box would disappear, and then York and the NPC would be in a staring contest. No way to move, no way to back out, and I would have to personally close the game and reload a save just to continue on. And that happened over 10 times that I captured, but many more times as I was just playing the game. Sorry, boss, but this is a smoke-free hotel. If you're dying of smoke, head out the entrance and you'll find a smoking area in the rear parking lot. Don't tell me. You're the bellboy. At your service, boss. The soft locking made me so paranoid that anytime I would make just the most minute amount of progress, I'd run over to a phone, save my game, and then continue on. And it does have an autosave feature, but it's only when you enter and exit buildings. Sometimes you're trying to do a quest where you're hunting a bunch of enemies all at once, and maybe you have a ridiculous number, like one quest has you fighting 30 crocodiles, punching out 30 bees, and killing 30 stray dogs. There's 90 different animals to hunt, so of course you want to do it all in one go, you got nothing better to do, and then once you go to claim your reward, boom, the game soft locks, and then you can't get your progress back. I don't know what it is about Savior, and of course it had to be the character that walks around in his underwear all the time, but all the missions surrounding Xavier or just following him around for a day will really highlight the weaknesses in this game's engine. Just the most bizarre creepypasta shit happens when you hang out with Xavier. For example, in Xavier's main quest line, you have to go to his bar and drink the daily drink up until Sunday, where you then stalk him for the day and then show up at his house because the bar is closed, and then you ask ask him for the secret drink so you can get the final bead and then take it to the mirror. Yes, all that happens. Well, he was doing some push-ups on the ground. I asked him for the final drink. I drank that drink and then both Xavier and I melted into oblivion. 
It was the most horrifying shit. There was no way to get out of this. Francis is just floating in air and slowly being crushed by the pressure of gravity until he turns into Francis Roblox Morgan. Check it out. In DP2, there's no cast introduction at large. You just show up at places because a strange voodoo man told you to, and then you're introduced to another eccentric character. Rarely do the NPC's storylines intersect with the main plot. Everyone's just placed in their little wacky box to be opened up when the plot demands it, then you do a quest for them, close the box, and forget about them because they were insignificant to begin with. This time around, they opted to make caricatures instead of characters, and that notion permeates into our protagonist as well. Deadly Premonition 2's York fell victim to this phenomena known as flanderization. Basically, it means taking the little quirks that we like about a character and then letting them grow and overshadow the rest of the character until they become an unrecognizable two-dimensional caricature that only exists to say funny quips and smart things with out pause. This is it, Zack. A deadly premonition. Oh look, he said the thing! Zack. A deadly premonition. Ah, oh, he said the thing again! Ghostbusters. 1984. Directed by Ivan Reitman. Haha, <laughs> Ghostbusters. Good one. I've seen that. Who do we blame in this situation? The fans for memeing the weird quirks of York's personality? Or the writers for pandering to the fans? Okay, fans love that York drinks coffee, so let's have that be an integral part of his personality. Uh, sure. We can try making it key to solving the case, just like last time. FK in the coffee? Uh, no. He just spills some of it on the carpet or some shit. Hmm. Okay, what else do we know about our leading man? He also loves movies. Good shit. Let's double the amount of scenes where he rambles endlessly about every film from the past 30 years. Hmm, can we tone it down a little? Make those scenes optional? Like in the first game, a player could just push a button if they were interested. What are you, fucking dumb? No! We'll have him talk about movies every time he hops on a skateboard or talks to another character. No dead air, ever! O okay Just relax. Alright, what else? Ah! Remember the diner scene where York graphically describes a grisly murder scene he worked on, which makes the small town sheriffs uncomfortable when they're eating? <laughs> yeah, that was a funny moment. It worked so well because it caught the players off guard too. How about this? He mentions a murder case, no, 40 murder cases throughout the course of the game, subjecting the players to relentless cold case porn until they're eventually desensitized to it. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious! I don't think that's such a good idea. Come to think of it, you're not even on the writing team. Just shut the fuck up and make memes. Memes are the secret to making profits grow. Red Tree! What else is there to say about Lucari, other than it feels rather lifeless for an open world game released in the year 2020? There's barely any cars driving around, or NPCs on the field. You're more likely to encounter stray dogs, or a wild pack of rabid squirrels, than you are other people. It is far more scaled back than its 2010 prequel. Even with all the technical concessions made within DP2's engine, from the 
abysmal draw distance to the frequent texture pop in, all the sharp and jagged aliasing, none of these choices did anything to improve the performance. And I'm stumped here. It's really difficult to determine what the biggest performance taxing element was that's causing all the frame rate dips in the first place. Was it the bump up to 1080p? Well, if that's the case, why not downscale the game to 720p or hell, even 480p if it made for a better gameplay experience. By the way, I did try downscaling the game to 480p within the Switch's system menu, and I'm sad to report that it did nothing to fix this shit. It even looks terrible on a CRT. So I did what any sane person in my situation would do. I bought the cheapest HDMI to RCA downscaler and hooked it up to my Commodore 1084 monitor. And you know what? It still looks a little shitty. You can see from a distance too that it's rainbow banding and it's just juddering a little bit. Uh, I guess it does mask some of the pop in from the draw distance. So from a glance, it doesn't look too bad, does it? This is odd playing this way, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Deadly Premonition 2, the way it was meant to be enjoyed on an old ass CRT monitor, downscaled from HDMI to RCA. It still doesn't fix the performance issues. As you can see, the frames are dropping during rotation. And once we get up to Casa Pineapple where there's a lot of action, you can still see it's running at a full 15 frames per second. This is the latest edition. The colors and brightness do look nice though. For a late generation PlayStation 2 game, Deadly Premonition 2 is quite beautiful. Oh, it's for the Switch. <laughs> An easy mistake to make. Now, I wouldn't give your hopes up on Deadly Premonition 2 getting a port to any other console or the PC anytime soon. In the official Japanese trailer for Deadly Premonition 2, there's these big bold words that say, coming to Switch only. So take that for what you will. For now, it seems there's no optimal way to play Deadly Premonition 2. Should I just give up? Oh no, I'm not giving up. In a desperate time like this, you gotta call on the help of an expert, a DP expert. Take it away. What up, Hikiko fam? It's ya boy, Captain Psychopath here, certified DP expert. Mm. Like all of you, I too was excited to get my hands on Deadly Premonition 2. And I even bought a Switch to play it, but uh, well, my Switch isn't working properly. Also, performance on the Switch is uh, not the best. This led me down the road of emulation. Yuzu is an in-development emulator for Switch, also a citrus plant. So I'm here today to tell you whether or not Yuzu is useful or Yuzu-less. Come on, let's get to it. So downloading Yuzu is pretty straightforward, just do it. On my first boot up, I just decided to run with the default settings using the Vulkan renderer, as I do have an AMD card, and uh... Uh, damn it. Results weren't... great? Now, by switching to OpenGL and disabling Enable Audio Stretching, I got it to run and sound a little bit better. Ah, uh, damn it. What a way to start the new year. At this rate, I'll be dead by Easter. Quiet down, Agent Jones. You're on the clock. And, well, it's uh, still not on par with Switch, which, uh, that's pretty bad. So I figured I'd reach out to someone with an NVIDIA card in case those perform better. Fellow Hikiko family member Vladlen was glad to help. 
Alongside a friend, they both sent me footage of the game running on their PCs, and, uh, well... This doesn't look too good. So, in the end, it turns out Yuzu is... usable? Like, it's... it works, but it's, uh, sadly worse than Switch. Though, in the future, with the, the emulator developing, it should... Hopefully, eclipse the switch port. Also, sweary. Come on, give us a give, give us a different port of this game, huh? Don't you agree, Hikiko? Why does the music sound terribly compressed any time they reuse a track from the original game? Did they just straight rip the soundtrack from DP Origins and think nobody would notice? Well, I noticed. I'm the sheriff, George Woodman. Call me George. Here's what it's supposed to sound like. And here's what it actually sounds like. I was especially disappointed by the removal of the real-time weather system from the first game. That was one of the most unique features the original had to offer. Each morning you could wake up, turn on the television, and get a forecast for the rest of the day. And the weather would have a major impact on the routines of all the citizens of Greenvale. Some side quests could only be triggered when it was raining outside. The weather also tied into the lore of the Raincoat Killer and the history of Greenvale. Also, at one point, the game was called Rainy Woods, so weather played an important role in the genesis of the series. I guess they ran out of ideas on what to do with the weather system in 2, because they didn't even bother. Lucari feels like it's stuck in a Punxsutawney time loop. Each day is as indistinguishable from the last. The weather is constant now. It's perpetually sunny. Hurricane Katrina is used as a major plot device later on in the game that affects multiple characters throughout our story, yet there's absolutely no foreshadowing of Hurricane Katrina. You don't watch a news broadcast about how the summer of 2005 is going to bring this apocalyptic hurricane. Nope, just shows up conveniently to wash away all the plot holes. She washed all that away. Every last trace. The only change in weather we get comes once the clock strikes midnight. A large fog rolls across the city, and then these creatures known as Red Shadows attack you. Hmm, why does this happen every night at midnight? I don't know. What are the Red Shadows? I don't know. For what it's worth, I do know that they endlessly spawn until morning, and they break the frame rate even more if that was possible. There is a little bit of lore surrounding them, and it comes from a throwaway dialogue that Patty mentions about how the Red Shadows are boogeymen that snatch kids up or something, but ultimately their relevance to the culture of Lucare or the plot itself is understated at best. The Red Shadows do appear during the investigation when York enters a singularity. During these trips to the other world, York's arm turns into a tree branch slash gun. Sadly, there's even less of a challenge or variety to the combat in DP2. Instead of giving the player a wide assortment of breakable melee weapons and guns to change up the monotonous shooting gallery segments, you're now stuck with one handgun and really bad melee punching mechanics. The target reticle is ridiculously wide. It seems as if this game was developed with the Wii mode in mind. It is possible that they might have been trying to implement some sort of motion control in the aiming, but just abandon that idea. They also included a lock-on charge shot, which seems to be a concession for the terrible aiming. Yeah! 
the only sort of cool thing is that you'll acquire items to enhance your gun, which is named Mr. Alligator, by the way, but there's no real incentive to do so. Most of the enemies will drop after a few shots to the face, and the upgrades tend to boil down to personal preference. Do you want better range but worse accuracy? How about powered up shots but a terrible rate of fire? It's all a trade off unless you invest a serious amount of time into the crafting system. I will admit, I did enjoy mixing and matching the talisman loadouts, which are handled by these altars. I just wish the game would give you a reason to get involved in this elaborate crafting system. Like perhaps make a legendary enemy that takes a lot of damage as a hunt in the side quests? Even all the boss fights fall after a few well-placed charge shots. There's zero challenge going on here. As a player, I have no say in the difficulty of my experience, unless I deliberately gimp myself to have no upgrades whatsoever. How fun! What gets me is that the original had difficulty options, and then they were later removed in each subsequent release. Is it really all that hard to implement difficulty options in video games? I mean, as far back as the Atari 2600, video games had difficulty options. Everything about DP2 feels patronizing. It's as if the developers had no faith in the player whatsoever. Even when it comes down to the most basic of puzzle solving, autopilot York Morgan will blurt out the answer to each puzzle for you. And this is especially evident during the drawbridge mystery. Zach, this password may look complicated at first glance, but you needn't worry. This is a chemical formula. Challenge from Professor R. The ancient tattoo all the leftmost panels stands for hydrogen. In other words, the leftmost panel represents a molecule. You get the three hydrogen atoms merged. All you need to do is figure out which chemical is the remaining panel. Sure, you know. Water, Zach. Zach. Figured it out yet? The chemical formula is CH3OH methanol. It's got to be COH, starting from the left in that order. Did you really think this was engaging at all? Why couldn't you just leave me a few notes around the room and let me put it together myself? Can't risk the player encountering any form of challenge or critical thinking in their mystery game. The only prevalent challenge found within the experience is keeping up with York's hygiene again. It's a carryover mechanic from the first and the same rules apply. Feed York, make sure he takes a nappy, or have him chug coffee if you want to keep him away. This time they've separated body odor and suit cleanliness into two separate statuses. I don't know why. It is cool that outside of the monetary penalties, the stinky agent will attract wild animals to York, which makes hunting a tad easier. They actually thought about something. In conjunction with the three different brands of cigarettes now, they've also added the option to camp outside to pass the real time clock. The campgrounds will allow York to trade out gear and it provides a barrier from enemies, though you'll probably never make use of this. The world is so small that getting back to the hotel is always the most convenient option to pass time, so you won't likely ever take advantage of the camping system. There's also the most elusive of all mechanics, the tanning mechanic, and I still haven't been able to get my Steve Rambo tan discount at all the shops in town. What the fuck? Turns out, your tan and beard levels are reset once you complete a story chapter. So if you're playing the game at a normal progression, you won't ever see a tan or a full beard in one playthrough. Wow, cool. What else? Ah yes, the red room is back as a menu. And it's now missing the iconic tree branch transitions and the evil dead deer head to act as a representation of York's current status. It's much blander than the original and far less organized. The red room is now separated into a foreground layer for status and quest and a background layer for system based settings. The inventory is now one long list that you have to scroll through in order to organize your stuff. In the original, you had a neat little grid to see what you had on hand. I don't know why they made this change. I should also mention that the red room does appear as a physical area to explore in between the story chapters. Only the term explore is giving these moments too much 
much credit. The Red Room bits are just sad. They force Zack to walk down a long hallway whilst there's some form of narration playing on in the background. There's no surreal aspects to these moments, no guidance from mysterious figures to provide a new technique for Zack to use in his quest, or vague symbolic representations to ponder about, which may lead to an aha moment during the second playthrough. They're just a stripped down series of unrelated loading screens with a narrator. <laughs> This is just depressing. Now at this point in the video, I have said as much as one can without spoiling the major plot points of A Blemish in Disguise. Many of us have been waiting in anticipation for a Deadly Premonition follow-up for the better part of a decade, and the announcement of a sequel felt as if the impossible was made reality. Albeit the original game had its share of technical shortcomings and terrible port jobs thereafter, the ambitious inner workings of the game mechanics and charm of the cast elevated it beyond a $20 budget title. It was a cheap game, but it didn't feel cheap. Whereas 10 years later, Deadly Premonition 2 was released at $40, it feels like a $20 game. It's a prequel in terms of story, but feels like one in terms of technical performance. A small part of me dies in admitting this, but Deadly Premonition 2 is not a good game. Sure, there are brilliant moments tucked away in here, but they're never explored beyond a surface level. It's as if you're looking at a project that has a lot of borrowed game mechanics and half-baked plot threads that never converge to form its own distinct identity. There's not even a love it or hate it polarizing quality to it. <laughs> There's been a total flatline reaction from the press and fans alike. No one seems to care. Perhaps that's due in part from the lack of confidence this game exudes within its narrative. We're far from the B-movie overtures of gratuitous violence and sex that the original celebrated. They're nowhere to be found within this milquetoast quest to trigger the next check mark. <laughs> The heavy subject matters of violence, sexuality, and race are implied as issues being tackled within the off-screen undercurrent, but never displayed for the audience to witness as prevalent throughout Lucare. All the boundaries pushed by DP2's story ended up being an accidental consequence of a sloppy translation, which ran counter to the banner of inclusion that the writers were not so subtly hanging up in the lobby to greet you with. Person's birthplace nature, race, and physical features have no bearing on their value as a human being. We're always free, and we should respect each other just the way we are. In the attempt to create an idyllic depiction of the Deep South by not exploring the actual real issues found within the American South, we're left with a sugar-coated dystopia devoid of any relatable struggles that the audience could possibly connect to. So if you're the kind of person that's easily entertained by the dangling keys of movie trivia and inoffensive platitudes of equality, then Devoid of Provocation 2 is the story for you. It's like a kid's cuisine TV dinner. It's a surface level imitation of better meals to come before it. And the sad reality sets in after you take that first bite. You're just left with a hollow interior, lacking any spice or flavor. It's the least challenging meal of all time. <coughs> 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 This is awful. <laughs> God. Not good. <laughs> good. No, thank you. Oh, thank you. Here's an idea. Maybe if you keep dogpiling Swery on Twitter, he'll patch out the corn and replace it with another dessert. I love brownies. Ah. Ah. Mmm. This meal is so tasty. I don't know why people are complaining about the frame rate. It's fine. I enjoy it. The story's good. Oh. This is the meal of the year 2020. Oh. Ugh. <sighs> Ugh. 
I can't imagine what this experience would be like if you had never played the first Deadly Premonition. Even I've played through the original several times this year alone, and I still can't summarize all the moving pieces in a coherent manner to make it digestible for a YouTube video. On the surface, the original Deadly Premonition comes off as a little goofy and strange, but if you stick it through to the end, you'll come to realize there was a lot of thought and consideration put into the writing. There are tiny little setups and payoffs happening all throughout, and the well-trained eye from a second playthrough will help you catch on to all the setups happening in the background. Everyone has their place in the story. We're given so much detail in these characters that their ultimate motivations become clearly defined to us. Although we may want to foil their evil plans, we also get the other side of the story. We find out how they ended up that way. Contrasting the first against its sequel, and I've come to realize that Deadly Premonition 2 has dumb setups and unresolved payoffs. It's structured like a poorly written popsicle stick joke. Why did the FBI agent cross the road? Answer, because Forrest Kaysen made him cross the road off screen. Hope it wasn't a cherry flavored popsicle. Ah! One of my biggest gripes with Deadly Premonition 2 is it desperately needed some sort of bridging scene to connect the 2005 Lucari case to the 2010 Greenvale case. Greenvale is referenced several times throughout the dialogue in 2019, but its relevancy to the overall plot is nebulous and confusing at best. Deadly Premonition 2 tries to establish that in York's entire FBI career, he had only encountered the Red Seeds in two cases, once in Lucari and once again in Greenvale. Then he retired. However, that's not true according to the introduction of York in Deadly Premonition 1. He's looking through multiple cases where these red seeds were found at various other murder sites in previous cases that he worked on that happened off screen, none of which are referenced in the year 2019. There's another line in Deadly Premonition 1 that comes off as a little strange in retrospect. Comes after a moment where York has been attacked by all these shadow monsters. I've been through a lot of crazy situations, but that one, that one takes the cake. It's the first time I've been attacked so directly. Really, York? Never been attacked so directly? None of this rings a bell? <laughs> first time I've been attacked so directly. All Deadly Premonition 2 needed was a scene to explain why he forgot the events of Lucare in 2010. Just create a scene where York gets hit on the head by, I don't know, a wooden beam from a burning building, and then put in a throwaway line where York had to take a hiatus from the FBI to deal with his short-term memory loss. Look guys, I'm no doctor and it doesn't have to make medical sense. It would just help alleviate a lot of the plot holes between 2005 and 2019. That's all I'm saying. Among other things, Deadly Premonition 2 lacks suspense. It hits you over the head with who the bad guys are in town. Oh. In the first scene in Lucari, you're told by David about the rich dynasty that owns and controls everything in this town. What do you know about the Clarkson's house? Now, I ain't got nothing bad to say, but I'm gonna talk straight to you. You best dear clear that place. That family ain't just some gang. They're a whole different kind of beast. They folks with real power. Remnants of the good old boys who shaped America in the early days. Especially the head of the family, P.J. Clarkson. He's the kind of monster who goes around eating other monsters. Hmm, I wonder who done it. Who could have so much power and money to cover up this murder? It's almost as blatant as this. But wait, Miles, what about red herring number one? But wait, Miles, what about red herring number two? But wait, Miles, what about red herring number three? What about red herring number four? What about red herring number five? But wait, Miles, oh, it's just fucking Forrest Kaysen again. It's stupid and it doesn't feel earned. Kaysen. Oh. Don't give me that look, Zack. 
<laughs> All of the mystery is deliberately yanked away from the player. The wonder is gone. And now the crime scenes are shown to you in great detail, without obscuring information or visual evidence to let your mind fill in the gaps. <laughs> The criminal profiling segments, if you could really call them that, are an absolute joke. There's no buildup or suspense. York just arrives on the crime scene and then taps into a metaphysical plane of existence. Here, he's able to see all the suspects, the victim, and the method in which they were murdered with full-on DVD commentary from all the parties involved. <laughs> Nothing is hidden from the player. Once again, Deadly Premonition 2 assumes its audience is not capable of connecting the dots on their own. Oh, I wonder who killed Lise Clarkson. Maybe I'll find... Oh, it's just her mom. Oh, shit. I guess we need a new mystery to solve. Who made the drugs? Oh, it's just Lise's older sister, Lena. Okay, but why did she make the drugs? Because Forrest Kaysen told her to off screen. Wow, what a roller coaster of ups and downs. I cried at the ending. I commend you sorry for your good work. Please, RT. More than anything, I'm just disappointed with how they handled Melvin's story. It really seemed like it was building up to something. But like everything else, it was disappointing and predictable. Sheriff with Wood in their name presents themselves as a friend. They have a sick relative to tend to, so they can't hang out with you. The sheriff is also secretly harboring a double life and a terrible secret that involves the Red Seeds. Oh, but wait, they were just manipulated by the true big bad, Forrest Kaysen. Guys, we're on game two and the story has already become formulaic. The big reveal that Melvin was some sort of Red Seeds clan member that's fulfilling a blood purge ritual to honor the legacy of his one true love, Lena Dunham, Lena Doman, was such a wasted opportunity. And I personally feel that there's a missing chapter here that was left on the cutting room floor. I believe the developers had plans for Melvin to show up in the story in his clansman robe at other points to lead the player to think that there was a serial killer, just like the raincoat killer. This thought was inspired by a glitch that happened during episode two. At nighttime, I somehow managed to skate onto the river in between the plantations, and I found Melvin just hanging out in a boat in his cult robe. And as you might predict, if you try to talk to him, it freezes the world, and then you have to reboot the game. <laughs> But it just makes me wonder if they had more in mind for Melvin. In retrospect, Melvin's story arc has all the markings of a great setup for something grotesque and wild to happen. Just look at Candy Woods over here. Just look at her. With her full-on goddess of fertility mode bod due to Melvin pumping her up with San Rouge. He's been secretly playing the role of the evil feeder husband. Deep down, I was hoping this would finally pay off in some awesome way. I mean, Candy Woods looks like she's going to morph into some giant amorph red tree blob at any moment. There's a really good lead up to finally confronting Melvin Woods in the boathouse, and it's the closest this game comes to having a showdown with a real killer. But once more, it's robbed from us. There's no showdown, there's no boss fight, the boathouse just catches fire, and Hurricane Katrina washes the plot holes away off screen. It's as if none of this shit mattered because the bad guys were all under the influence of Forrest Case in one once again. Speaking of Kaysen, why is he here? Kaysen! Ah! <sighs> oh dear. <laughs> Suffice it to say, the whole case and inclusion was shoehorned into the plot at the last minute. Contrasted against the first game, where they did an excellent job of setting up the whole mystery around Kaysen and the Red Seeds. Forrest Kaysen. He's the one. 
We are shown that he's been around a long time, and he's been operating under multiple identities throughout the years. In DP-1, we see Kaysen dressed as a soldier, dispatching the purple gas bioweapon on the townspeople of Greenvale, causing the 1950s Greenvale Massacre. He sets up the entire myth of the raincoat killer. Also in the Red Room, there are little Kaysen dolls spread across the United States, all dressed a little differently, to suggest that he has taken on many identities over the years to spread the influence of the Red Seeds. What I'm getting at is, he has a purpose for being in the original. I saw you, Zach. Want to know how the game handles Kaysen's setup in DP2? They randomly cram Willy into a story mission where he slowly trots around the entire town of Lucare and points out some red trees. This mission is arguably the most tedious one found in the game, but there is a close contender. The Lord Hungers! I recognize that DP1 also had a Willy segment, but it was handled much better there. For one, the game adds a twist. It lets you play as another character for a change, Emily Wyatt. From the start, she's given a clear mission and destination. Get to the town hall and rescue York. The monotony of following Willy is broken up with character interactions between Emily and Kaysen. It also cuts to bits with York in captivity. Will Emily make it in time? The buildup is paid off with Emily facing off against the shadows, and then they follow it up with the showdown with Thomas in the clock tower. It goes from being one of the worst segments to one of the best by the end. So what's the big payoff for the Willy mission in DP2? What was it all building up towards? Hey Patty, stay away from those weird fucking trees. I would have just accepted one scene, one scene to establish Forrest Kaysen in Lucari in 2005 that wasn't a Luigi's Mansion ghost model standing in a room. Even from a surface level, his design here lacks any surprise. Kaysen appears as a sapling salesman, again, in the exact same clothing. Come on. We know he's a demon capable of shape-shifting, so why not take advantage of that character trait? Perhaps take someone from the story and have them be Kaysen in disguise. Honestly, I thought the writers were setting up Simon Jones as a double agent from the start. He comes off as a very shady character, as if there's some hidden agenda that was set to be uncovered in the third act. And we know Simon's been keeping tabs on Zack for many years, and he acts unusually nervous during the interrogation. Aaliyah also comments on this unusual behavior coming from her partner. Agent Jones. Is something the matter? Snap out of it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know, I know. Do you? Then stop daydreaming. Okay, okay. I just... You just what? Maybe he could have been the one that's been keeping Zack from reuniting with Patricia, so the ritual of the fertility goddess could go off without a hitch. Pizza will never betray me. Pizza? The whole third act of the game lacks any shock or impact of the original. Shit just sort of happens without any rhyme or reason, and not in a charming way. For a moment, I thought the game was gonna have some guts when Zack goes full on Shadow the Colossus mode by turning into a red tree monster. Here, I thought we were gonna assume the role of Aaliyah Davis and slay our beloved Zack to save the day. Sure, killing off a beloved protagonist is old hat nowadays, but it would have at least been something to work towards in the third act. Besides, whatever happened to the whole, there are some things in this world that must be purged, theme of sacrifice from the original. Emily had to die to stop Kaysen's master plan, so why not Zack? I'm not sure what the message 2 was trying to get across here. Yes, there's evil in this world, but you can just tag team your other personality to fight the final boss, but only one time. I'm warning you!
Also, Zack and Kacen's fates are now inexplicably bound together. So I guess if Zack lives, Kacen lives. He and I are two sides of the same coin. We've always been one in the same. If I disappear, so will he. So you're telling me Zack's father and Emily's sacrifices were in vain? Also, this boss fight didn't matter in the end because Kaysen will just come back since Zack is still alive? Just kill off Zack. It looked like you were setting up Aaliyah to have the same paranormal powers as him, and it looked like you were gonna set her up to be the brand new protagonist in the third game, but that never panned out. Red tree! The ending is a bunch of hollow nothingness. We're left with more questions than answers. What happened to that brain tumor? Was the tumor just a metaphor for Forrest Kaysen? Or did Zack just get chemo off screen? Why was Emily Wyatt a fairy with Rumpelstiltskin rules where if you guess her name correctly, she dies? Don't say it, please. Whatever you do, just don't say her name. Emily Wyatt. No! Why is she alive again at the end? Do they have AOL Instant Messenger in the other world? How did Zack grow his hair back in the director's cut? Did Zack start a family off screen? Is little Emily here actually Patricia's daughter? And is Zack just assuming a surrogate grandfather role and then telling his friend's daughter violent bedtime stories? Is that what I'm being led to believe here? Maybe Hoongin's bowling ball represents the writers and the pins represent our expectations. <laughs> my friends, it was not my intention to shit all over Deadly Premonition 2. I wanted to love it. I wanted to love it more than any other game that had ever been released in my lifetime. It was an underdog. Uh, the first one and this one. It had absolutely no reason to come back into existence, but it did, and I'm happy it did. And if you're out there and you like Deadly Premonition 2, don't take it as me insulting you for enjoying it. I just personally think it's a flawed product, an extremely flawed product. And it feels like a major step backward compared to the first one. And since this is a sequel, I guess debatably because some of the ends between the two are not tied in a coherent manner, but what can you expect for a surreal horror game? I digress. Deadly Premonition 2 is something that I am very happy does exist, and I'm glad that I picked it up on day one. Even though it ran at 14 frames per second, I still had a fun time with the Deadly Premonition community, talking about all the little secrets that we found together, and discussing story elements. Uh, I just personally think it feels rushed and unfinished overall, and that's the truth. And for now, this sweary file remains a cold case because I believe this story is going to continue to grow, whether or not it comes through multiple patches down the road, or maybe a subsequent port does end up happening. Regardless, I hope this does not become the standard for Deadly Premonition. <laughs> I really hope they take a step back and realize they made a lot of great mistakes that hurt some people out there and and hurt dedicated fans of this franchise. And I don't know, guys. It ends kind of on a dour note here, but uh, I expected better. What could I say? My hopes were too high. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me on this wild and long adventure for the Sweary Files Part 2. <laughs> it was a different beat from the first one. And I'm sorry if you're not used to me yet. You will be. I ain't going anywhere. Neither is the Sweary Files. See you all next time. Maybe in another time or space. I'm out of strawberry bubblegum. <laughs>